We see from the protesters, we see from the people in the streets of all races now, that people are sick of watching black men murder. So in the wake of public outrage following George Floyd's death, the fatal shooting of yet another black man by police in Atlanta has reignited calls for racial justice and an overhaul of the current policing system. Rashard Brooks's death has already uh, prompted a few ramifications overnight. As we mentioned, Atlanta Police Chief Erica Shields stepping down from her post. The officer who fired the shot that killed Brooks has now been fired and another has been placed on administrative duty. But how likely is it that these officers will be charged? Back with me is Philip Atiba Goff, also joining the discussion. Uh, excuse me, Judith Brown Dianis, Executive Director of the Advancement Project National Office, and MSNBC legal analyst Paul Butler, author. Uh, of chokehold. Great to have all of you with us. Paul, let me begin with that question straight to you. The different situations between what we're seeing with um, the Richard Brooks case versus the George Floyd case obviously probably centers around that physical altercation where he resisted an arrest when the officer said to him, I'm going to arrest you, put your hands behind your back, and then he attempted to flee. Is that in of itself enough to change the dynamic of the case? No. The police are only allowed to kill to save a life. When Mr. Uh, Mr. Brooks was running away with the stun gun, he posed no deadly threat to these officers. Their use of deadly force, their killing him was cowardly and it was criminal. Judith, uh, the comparisons are obviously going to be that this was yet another unarmed black man, that he was uh, sleeping in his car. But as I was saying to uh, Mr. Butler there, the difference is going to be in that interaction, which, uh, according to some, came after several minutes of the police trying to speak to Mr. Brooks. What is it that you would want to learn about that interaction that could have possibly justified him uh, wanting to leave the scene or fleeing the scene because he may have felt that you know what, he's also being threatened by the police. Well, here's a problem that we have. Black people in this country fear the police. And so we saw in McKinney, Texas, for example, that video where a young man drove through a stop sign, allegedly, and then drove to his grandmother's house for protection. And he got out the car and he put his body down on the ground. So right now, we should know that people do not trust the police. It's been like that for quite some time. And so we didn't see a de-escalation. In fact, I mean, one of the things that we need to also consider is that these, this officer actually shot at him, like Walter Scott, um, and this is in the middle of a parking lot where they endangered the lives of others. They had decided they were gonna hunt him down and that they were going to have retribution for the scuffle that they had had. So, you know, we're at a point in time where you would think that the police are learning something from what's going on and that is not happening. Um, Mr. Goff, let's talk a little bit about the uh, reaction so far from the police department, the firing of one officer, administrative duty for another, the police chief resigning. Uh, first of all, is this, is this enough? Is this the right way to respond immediately after an incident like this? But is it more importantly enough in the first few days following a shooting like this? So whether or not it's enough is going to be up to the people of Atlanta. Um, and I, I pray that uh, their voices are going to get heard, that they are brought into the right rooms, so that the decisions that are, are being made for the most vulnerable communities are being made by the most vulnerable communities. Um, whether this is the right decision, we're going to find out, and the people of Atlanta are going to tell us. I can tell you that um, most of the time, uh, a chief loses their job when there's a change of administration, or when the crime rate goes up, or there's a bad shoot. We don't hold law enforcement executives accountable to our values long term, in part because we haven't really measured those sets of things. But I will say that as we're trying to figure out what the right steps are after another and another and another and another one of these shootings, it will be really important for us to stop trying to figure out whether or not a shooting is justified and put a lot more energy trying to reimagine how we stop them happening in the first place. How do you think that is, uh, how do you think we go about doing that as a society? So I think you're hearing it. I mean, we've been, hear we've been hearing it from people in the streets for the last th three weeks. People are talking about, we need to put the resources back into communities so they don't have to call the police in the first place, right? Like, I have lived in suburban neighborhoods. I have friends who come from neighborhoods where their parents were asleep 
drunk in cars blocking the driveway and nobody calls the cops. You call a coach tow truck, you knock on the door, you push the car, you, know, you, you find the other set of keys. There are other ways to manage this. Um, and when you have the resources of mental health and substance abuse, when you have good schools and good grocery stores that have fresh vegetables, when you have the things in the community that prevent you from calling the cops in the first place, everybody's safer. Nobody, especially the police, want you to live in a community where you have to rely on them or you can't be safe. And yet the conversations that are sparking out, in part because of deliberate misunderstandings of the demands of protesters, is that without police, we can't possibly be safe. Well, how is it working in the communities that have plenty of money? In the communities where they're not calling the police all the time, mm. right? We imagine, we stereotype the, these inner cities, which is code for where black people live, as if they can't exist without armed guards to keep them appropriately in their cages, whether they be on the streets, or in jails and prisons. And we gotta stop that conversation entirely. That is not what it means to be American. That's not the American dream. And when we do that, we hamper our ability for all of us to realize it. Judith, uh, let me pick up on that point because I think that that is a very important point that just been brought up there. When we when we think about the current debate about defunding the police, it's become this bipolar conversation about um, either no police or complete anarchy, and that has people coming down on this side of the argument one way or the other in a, not a, in a you know, unconstructive way for what we're trying to achieve here as a society. Give us a sense of genuine police reform and defunding the police in tangible steps that people can understand does not mean letting the country become lawless, but at the same time means we are not going to kill unarmed black people. Sure. I, no one wants anarchy in our country. What we're calling for is defund because we need to reprioritize. We spend over $100 billion a year on law enforcement in this country. And what we're saying is instead of talking about community policing, I think Atlanta probably would say they have community policing. So would New York. Instead of saying, let's give them more money for training, Instead, let's take away some of that money and let's put it into social workers. Let's put it into violence interrupters. Let's put it into more schools. Because, you know, we continue to find money for the police at the same time that we have been closing schools. We have shut down public hospitals. We have taken money away from affordable housing so that we have a homelessness problem in this country. And so we're talking about refunding that money, redirecting that money into things that would make communities safer, safe from the police, but also safe and free in a different kind of way. And so, so we can do it, but we have to have the public will. And you know, one of the things that we should be paying attention to, and Congress needs to pay attention to this, and the Democrats need to pay attention to this, what are the people in the streets demanding? And it's not just black people. We have white allies who are by our side saying defund the police because we see that we have to reimagine safety for all of us. Yeah, in my experience of uh, covering some of the protests in the early stages of this, uh, certainly in Philadelphia, it was multi-generational, multi-racial. Uh, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Um, uh, Paul Butler, let me get your thoughts really quickly from the Fulton County District Attorney, Paul Howard. He put out a statement uh, in part that reads, my office has already launched an intense independent investigation of the incident. Members of the Fulton County District Attorney's office were on scene shortly after the shooting and we have been in investigative sessions ever since to identify all of the facts and circumstances surrounding this incident. Give me your legal take on where an investigation like this goes. What are some of the fundamental questions that you need answered to determine the course of uh, action as a district attorney? Was the shooting justified? We have no evidence that it was. Again, Mr. Uh, Brooks faced no deadly Threat. And so he was not allowed under the law to kill someone in response. At the end of the day, this is about culture. This is about a warrior mentality in, among the Atlanta Police Department. The Georgia NAACP president said, we're done dying. That's only going to be true if police departments are not just reformed, but transformed. All right, uh, Philip, you're back with us next hour. Thank you to both Judith, Judith uh, Brian, Brown, Dianis, excuse me, and Paul Butler. Thank you both for joining us uh, this hour. Coming up, uh, Donald Trump ramps up another photo op. Stay with us. 
COVID-19 is hitting some Americans